Okay. Press start on the remote. <laughs> Three weeks from now, I'll have it all down, and I won't be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I know you had nothing to do with it, probably, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you here in Paris. My roots with the Sherbonneau family go way back because uh, in 19... 19- 69, when I was just a child and going to university in Windsor. <clears throat> My wife Jen and I had a home very close to the university. At that time, Audrey and a good friend of hers, Colleen, who later became Colleen Kallenberg, um, would come to our home just to get a break from university. And so over many, many years, we've been, connect- been connected with Dave and Audrey. And I had the privilege of uh, seeing some uh, pieces of Joel during his seminary years in Montreal because my associate at Lakeshore St. Andrew's Church was also going through the grind of of that uh, seminary experience. If you can survive seminary, you can survive anything. But thanks for the privilege of being here. I come from the wonderful metropolis of Puce. You, You all know where Puce is, right? Puce is a wonderful French community named after the inhabitants of the Puce River, which happened to be sand fleas. It's actually what the word Puce means in French, right? It means flea. So I come from a community of fleas. (laughs) You're really glad I'm here, right? I don't know about you, but I haven't got this gift-giving thing figured out yet. And even yesterday was a classic example. It was my wife's birthday yesterday, and we made our way to Toronto. And on our way to Toronto, I just, halfway through the journey, I kind of placed three little packages in front of her, and I said, happy birthday. And she opened them one by one. And the first one she looked at, and she said, oh, that's nice. I was hoping for more. The second one she opened and she said, it happened to be a set of earrings. I thought they were fabulous. You know, some fancy name. On, uh, I, I, this, this is, this is going to be a winner. And she said, oh, that's really cute. Especially when big earrings are popular these days and these were little ones. <laughs> and the third gift I gave her and she said, Well, I would never have thought of that. (laughs) Now, I've been helped in this whole gift-giving experience, and some of you may be familiar with the work of Gary Chapman and his infamous work about five love languages. Are you familiar with that? Chapman says it identifies five basic languages people use to speak love to others. Let's see if I can remember them. Acts of service. That's my wife's favorite. She's in Toronto this week, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to diligently work to do a whole bunch of things that are on the to-do list at home so that she will come home and be amazed. (laughs) Acts of service. Quality time is the second one that he identifies. A third one that he, he identifies are words of affirmation. And that's one of my... Physical touch and closeness is the primary language through which I receive love, even as an introvert. But the final one he identifies as gift-giving. And long before I ever read or Gary Chapman may ever have dreamed of love languages, I knew without question that my favorite way to express love to other people was through gift-giving. But the early days of our marriage were a little tumultuous. I would come home with a gift because in those days money wasn't plentiful in our home. And I would come home with the latest gift I had chosen for my wife, Jan. She would look it over carefully and she would then very gently say, what did that cost? Now I may need to translate what that means because I learned very quickly what it means. The real thing she was saying was this. 
isn't there something that we could have used the money better for? So that's a point of frustration for me. But the second point of frustration in this whole gift-giving exercise is I long for the day when I give somebody, well, it's happened on a couple of occasions, when I give somebody a gift and they look at it and they say, how did you know that's exactly what I was looking for? How did you know that was exactly what I was looking for? In fact, at one time I had a, fellow, a staff member at Lake Shore St. Andrews who was a rabid Detroit fan. Didn't matter the sport, he was a Detroit fan. And I would buy him all kinds of paraphernalia. And finally, one day he had the courage to come to me and say, Chuck, I don't like that stuff you give me. I've already got enough of it. Well, that wasn't exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> you, you may understand what I'm talking about if you look back on times in your life when you've been the recipient of a gift. Not the giver, but the recipient of a gift. Can you remember the last time you received a gift and you looked at it and you said, wow, that's exactly what I needed. That's exactly what I wanted. If you're honest, it doesn't happen all that often. I tried to think back in my life to being a recipient rather than giver of gifts. And I'll never forget the childhood memory because it still sticks out very clearly in my mind today. <clears throat> I longed to have a new bicycle. Now, there wasn't an abundance of financial resources in the home I grew up in. And I anticipated that my parents would go all out on this one occasion just for me. And when I saw the gift that they were giving me, I knew it wasn't a new bicycle because it wasn't big enough. It was a new seat for my old bicycle. <laughs> that wasn't exactly what I was looking for. Christmas is often a season of gift-giving frustration. But I thought it would be valuable for us in the three weeks that I have with you to be able to step back and maybe take a fresh look at the great gift that God has given us because you know the unique thing about the gift that God gave us? He knew exactly what we needed. He knew exactly what we needed. And our focus for these three weeks will be on that Isaiah 6, chapter 9 passage, particularly the sixth verse, which the choir just sang in an amazing way. And they introduced you to four components that we're going to be dwelling on in the, next, uh, in the subsequent two weeks that I'm with you. But in addition to that uh, Isaiah scripture, we'll also be taking a look into some of the ways in which the gift, Christ, in his life, in his birth and in his life, showed up as that gift to us in forms that convinced us that God knew exactly what it was we needed. And this morning you heard the scripture read. We supplement the scripture of Isaiah this morning with Mary's song. Most of us are well familiar with all of this. But let me remind you that Mary's first reaction to the gift that God gave to her wasn't, Oh good, that's exactly what I wanted. In fact, her first reaction was, and I'm using the message, a translation of this, she was thoroughly shaken. That wasn't what I wanted. But as God revealed his plan for her more fully, she came to a place, and I quote now, yes, I see it now. I'm the Lord's maid ready to serve. Let it be with me just as you say. She came to the point where she could say, the gift that you're giving me is exactly what I need. And it is my conviction, I'm going to work from this point of conviction, that the more we come to understand the, God, the gift God gave us in Christ, the more we'll be able to say, that was exactly what we needed in my life and on this planet. 
And I'm going to introduce you to four components of the gift this morning, if I could. And the first of those components will be this. Um, oh, let, me, let me go back for just a moment and let me just do this. Here's the, the part of this scripture that I wanted to make sure that we got a handle on. For a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us. He'll take over the running of the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. And those are the four components that we're going to look at in the next two weeks because two of those have to do with an inner, inward journey that all of us must take. And two of those have to do with an outward journey all of us must take in life. His ruling authority will grow and there'll be no limits to the wholeness he brings. And then this. And Mary said, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. And isn't that true? Here we are 2,000 years later, ready to sing your song. So I want to introduce you to four components of this this morning, if you'd go with me on this. Because the first thing I think is important to note is that this gift brings light into our darkest places. The gift of Christ brings light into the darkest places in our lives. Some of you here this morning will be familiar with Brennan Manning. His life was an amazing life. He died just this past year. His life is a life of amazing contrasts. In some moments, he would be in a highly effective priest and a gifted author. And in other moments, he'd be wasted by alcohol and would be found sleeping on the streets or on a park bench in front of a storefront. I remember the occasion when a woman was walking with her young son, and her young son became curious about this drunk lying in the front of a storefront. And out of his stupor, Brendan Manning remembers these words being said of him. As this woman grabbed her child and she said, we don't hang out with scum like that. So Brendan Manning is this amazing contrast in life at its best and life at its darkest. And on one of those occasions, at one of those dark times of his life, he was sent on a 30-day retreat. And he was given a single assignment, one verse of Scripture, that for 30 days he was to dwell on this Scripture, and it comes from the Song of Solomon. And it's found in Song of Solomon 7, verse 10. And that verse says this, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. For 30 days, Brennan Manning did nothing more than reflect on that one scripture. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. And out of the experience, he wrote one of the most astounding books I've ever read in my life. It's called The Furious Longings of God. And in the introduction of that book, Brennan Manning says about that verse of scripture, when you take these words personally, I mean very personally, a number of beautiful things come to pass. And I'm not going to list them all. I'm just going to highlight three of them for you. The drumbeats of doom in your head will be replaced by a song in your heart, which could lead to a twinkle in your eye.
love this techie stuff. We're good? Yes. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> so Brendan Manning says, if, if you get your heart wrapped around that verse, there are a number of things that will happen. The drumbeats of love of doom in your head will be replaced by a song in your heart, and possibly it could lead to a twinkle in your eye. Secondly, you'll not be dependent on the company of others to ease your loneliness, for he is Emmanuel, God with us. And one of the other things he highlights is the praise of other peoples will not send your spirit soaring, nor will their criticism plunge you into the pit. Their rejection may make you sick, but it will not be a sickness unto death. I love that. My favorite is this. You will live with the awesome awareness that the Father not only loves you, he actually likes you. Isn't that great stuff? In the darkest moment of Brennan Manning's life, a gift showed up in his life that was exactly what he needed. And that gift was Christ showed up in that moment. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Folks, I know that in a gathering this large, there's not a single possibility that there isn't a number of you here this morning in perhaps the darkest place in your life you've ever been. And I just want to encourage you to do something. Lean into the gift that God has given you. Lean into Christ, because in him you'll find light. The second thing that I think we understand by this, this gift enables us to enjoy, to, enables us enables joy in our saddest times. It enables joy in our saddest times. One of the most interesting questions I sometimes get to ask people is this, can you tell me about the most painful moment of your life? And recently when I asked a 20-year-old that question, he didn't hesitate for a single nanosecond. He said, absolutely. The day my mother stabbed my dad. And then he went on very quickly to say, it wasn't with a butcher knife or anything like that, it was with car keys, but I watched as my dad bled on the floor. And now 11 years later, that still is the strongest pain memory of his life. It's one of the saddest times of his life. And when I probe with him and a little further, he says... Now understand, this is a nine-year-old making a decision in that moment. And in the moment when that all unfolded, he said, to this very day, I feel guilty that I didn't do more to help my dad. Now how does a nine-year-old do more to help dad in a moment like that? As we talked further, it was very encouraging for me because a number of circumstances in Mike's life have driven him in pursuit of discovering who God is. And as he journeyed further into that and into that discovery process, he said this, God is bringing a deeper sense of contentment and even joy into my life these days. That's what the gift does. That's why God knew exactly what it was we needed. He knew exactly what we needed. He knew we needed a gift that could bring light into our dark places. He knew we needed a gift that could enable joy in our saddest times. God knew exactly. I need you to think with me for just a moment. It doesn't always start, our saddest moments don't all of a sudden just disappear. When you read Mary's song of joy in Luke chapter 1, you don't ever read it without engaging in that initial sadness that she felt when she first found out she was pregnant. You and I will never understand it fully, never grasp it fully, unless we can pull back 
And we can think about a time in our lives when we believed in something so strongly and we held to it so strongly, but there was something that broke that thing we're clinging to, something that invaded that. And there was one thing that Mary was committed to in her life. She was committed to sexual purity prior to her marriage. And now that was shattered. And from the initial sadness, she was able to move to her song of joy because she embraced the gift, because God knew exactly what she needed. Third observation I want to make is this. This gift is able to turn our brokenness into wholeness. This gift is able to turn our brokenness into wholeness. In a way only a God-inspired mind could grasp it. Isaiah paints a picture of wholeness, not only on an individual level, but a national level as well. And before he speaks of the great gift in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he speaks of the brokenness of the world in which he lives. And these are the words that he uses as recorded in the message translation. The abuse of oppressors, cruelty of tyrants, all their whips and cudgels and curses is gone, done away with. A deliverance as surprising and sudden as Gideon's old victory over Midian. The boots of all those invading troops, along with their shirts soaked with innocent blood, will be piled in a heap and burned, a fire that will burn for days. Only a God-inspired mind could grasp the magnitude of the gift that God was preparing to send to our planet. When we first began our ministry in just outside of Windsor, on Friday evenings, the young people would come to our house. We'd have an hour of kind of looking into the scripture and kind of getting a glimpse of what the scripture was offering us. And the kids weren't as keen about that as the second hour. We'd go over to the hall at the church and we'd play floor hockey or volleyball. And they weren't even as keen about that as they were coming back to our house and having goodies and refreshments. I used to often think I'd never get them out of there before breakfast. They'd hang around. But I'll never forget, because it was a Friday, first Friday in December... And we were just sitting down to supper, preparing for another Friday evening with those young people, when a phone call came from one of them, and he said, my girlfriend's been in an accident, and I need you to go to the hospital with me. And when we arrived at the hospital, we discovered that Fiona's mother and brother had both been killed. Her father was not expected to live. Fiona was badly injured, injured, and their best friend was also severely injured. To my amazement, when I looked at her and all the wounds that she had, the doctor said to us, to me, uh, we're going to send her home with you now. And we arrived at our home. All the young people had gathered in our home, and my wife Jan was helping them kind of pull together their thoughts and their feelings, get some of the stuff out of there, knowing what had, what had happened. And I brought Fiona in in her scarred way to that group, and they hugged her and loved on her like crazy. And my wife took me to the side and said, you and I need to go to the hospital. I've just had a miscarriage. Back to the hospital we go. A friend came over and babysat our daughter and took care of the kids that night, and I got my wife admitted to the hospital and went back home. That was Friday night. In less than 48 hours, I stood in in the pulpit on a Sunday morning to read a scripture. And the scripture that morning was Isaiah 9. And I did really well reading that scripture until there were two words that just stopped me dead in my tracks. And those two words were innocent blood. No more innocent blood. Fiona and her family had been hit by an impaired driver. My wife had been hit by an unexpected termination of a pregnancy. 
innocent blood. And those were moments of brokenness for myself and many of the kids that we were working with. And it was only over a period of time as we leaned heavily once again into the gift that God had given us that we discovered there is wholeness even in times of brokenness. God knew exactly what we needed. We needed light for our dark times. We needed a joy in, the, in our saddest times. We needed a, a healing for our times of brokenness. And finally, let me offer this one thought, this fourth thought. This gift that God gives to you and I, if we embrace it, the gift that he gives to you and I, is that it delivers hope to our times of despair. Recently, I, I asked a friend who was formerly it was a retired police officer if he'd do me a favor. I needed him to speak to our peer counseling unit at Windsor Police Service about an experience that happened to him in 1969. The first night that he was ever taken off his regular duties and put on stakeout in a convenience store, an armed robber entered the store and Bob was in pursuit of him as he left the store, and as he came around the corner, the robber was face to face with Bob holding a gun, and Bob fired one shot, and it killed the perpetrator. I asked him if he'd share what it was like to go through that experience, because there hadn't been much support given to him at the time, clearly nothing given to his wife and family. And he said he would do it, as, but we agreed that it needed to be in an interview format because he said, I'm not capable, even you know, 46 years later, I'm not capable of telling the story without breaking into tears. And I picked him up the morning when we were to go to the venue where we were going to he was going to share the story. And he said on the way, do you mind if I talk about my faith? I looked over at him and I said, Bob... Think about this for a moment. What have I done all my life of, as a career? Talk about my faith. You better talk about your faith. In fact, I not only want you to talk about your faith, I think there are people there that need to know when you go through those painful, hard, broken moments of your life, what gets you through? And so, in a very beautiful, simple, non-threatening, non-judgmental way, Bob reached a point in the story where we're dialoguing, and he says, but I need you to know, I don't believe I could ever have come through that if it hadn't been for my faith in Christ. It is the thing that brought me through that. Because he said, I'd reached a point where I thought if I never work another day as a police officer, that might be the best thing that could ever happen to me. It was the moment of deepest despair I've ever experienced in my life. And Bob can stand today and he can tell the story because his faith delivered the gift, delivered hope to his despair. I've been having a delightful time with the group that I'm having accountability with, a group of guys we meet every couple of weeks, and we're working our way through this wonderful little book called The Knight in Rusty Armor. And the knight who is unable to get out of his rusted armor is sent on a journey. And in the journey, he's reminded that you need to take this journey alone. We're going to send a couple of travel partners with you, a pigeon and a squirrel. But you need to know that this journey is a gift to you. However, his advisor on the journey said to him, a gift to be a gift has to be accepted. Otherwise, it lies like a burden between people. I longed yesterday to hear my wife look at one of those three gifts and say this, that's exactly what I needed. But I'm still waiting. <laughs> oh, she embraced the gifts that I gave her. Because otherwise it would just be a burden. 
But I came this morning to tell you this, that when God decided to give us a gift, he knew exactly what we needed. And the point at which we'll understand that it was exactly what we needed is the point at which we embrace it as exactly what we needed. Bringing light into our darkest places, enabling joy in our saddest times, turning brokenness into healing or wholeness, delivering hope to our places of despair. Let me pray with you.